Coming up on this episode of Fast TV, we're at Crichton Royal Farm to find out about its globally significant research into dairy cattle. We learn how young stalk are managed and why slurry management is cutting the use of fertilizers. If you don't know what your pH level is, how are you ever going to fix it? If you don't know which, you need a, a marker. The SRUC's Crichton Royal is a dairy unit in Dumfries. Hugh and his team run the Research and Innovation Centre with the main aim of developing and implementing information on sustainable breeding and management systems for dairy cattle. I'm Hugh McClymont, uh, I'm the farms manager here for SRUC for the South and West Farms here in Dumfriesshire. Uh, we're standing on Crichton Royal Farm here at the moment, but we've also got Acrehead and I'm also responsible for uh, the Barony Farm too, which is 10 miles north of Dumfries. I've been working with SRUC uh, when I reached October this year, I'll have clocked up 42 years service. Crichton Farm came into being long before me, although I've been here quite a considerable time. Finished the, the building of the lovely sandstone building. Uh, they were completed in 1896, when then the farm's main purpose was to provide a food source for the clientele of the Crichton Royal Hospital. And it also provided a therapy, again, for the, for the clientele that were, were some of them that were also employed on the farm uh, to, to bring there. But it was really a food source for, for the, the, the staff and the clientele that were based within the Crichton Royal Psychiatric Facility, as it was called then. We actually lease this farm here from the Scottish Government. It's on a 25-year rolling lease, so we don't own any of the facilities here. They are leased on a full agricultural tenancy, and the land stretches to 240 hectares of land leased from Scottish Government. I have other land, additional land parcels, which brings me up to a total of about 300 hectares. Cow numbers on, on Crichton Royal and Acrehead, uh, cow num adult cow numbers, just recently did a stock count and valuation, that were at 430 cows and, and carrying about 170 dairy heifers, milking twice daily now on 12 hour intervals. Formerly we were three, three, three times a day milking. We were now tw uh, twice a day at 12 hour intervals, six in the morning and six at night. The Crichton aims to represent dairy farms across Scotland. Like many farms, Crichton has had its own challenges to overcome. Like any other dairy farmer, yes, I'm wearing the badge of SRUC, but that doesn't make you any different. I have the daily challenges of the weather, and then on top of that, obviously, the challenges of running any large dairy farm these days, and I still think that one of the biggest challenges is labour and getting good quality labour and retaining good quality labour. And I would say then the next challenge we do face, like every other farmer, we're now moving in the, in the, in the severing of the bonds with Europe. We now have to look and, and, and embrace new ideas and new thinking. And environmental challenges have been a part of it too. Like any other dairy farmer now in the, in the modern world, uh, the environmental challenges are there. Uh, and these are now the way we are going to have to manage our farms uh, because uh, carbon and, and, and carbon sequestration is a, is a key thing there. So one of the things that, that SRUC and certainly I've been fairly instrumental here at, at Crichton Royal and the other farms that I do, I do manage is using best practice of managing the farm nutrients. And I mean the nutrients that's in the large tanks that we, where we store all the animal manures and uh, regular testing of those manures and, 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 and again uh, sticking to a protocol of regular applications during the growing season. We do sit within an N a nitrate vulnerable zone or an NVZ and that has obviously made me focus a bit more on that. The research is an important part of the work carried out at the Crichton. We find ourselves here in the cubicle shed which houses the I'm going to say the famous uh, Langhill herd, Langhill herd at Crichton Royal. Langhill is the name of the University uh, of Edinburgh farm, uh, basically in the outskirts of Edinburgh. But way back in 2002, 
the nucleus of that herd uh, relocated to Crichton Royal. Lang Hill uh, project is one of the longest running breeding projects in the Holstein Frisian world. So we're approaching 50 years now of running uh, two distinct lines of Holstein Frisian cattle. The uh, select line, which is the high genomic or high genetic merit animals, have been selected over these years for a combined fat and protein, so really high milk constituents. And throughout that there, and, and through the progress in, in the breeding, those animals have on a traje trajectory of producing very high quality milk there and, and, and reasonable yields. Uh, so that throughout the time. The other cows, which you cannot identify because they're all black and white, are the Lang Hill control line, and they are re representative of the average genetic merit that you would find uh, throughout the United Kingdom in the Holstein world. On my left, we have the high energy diet, which uh, the diet consists of about four to four and a half tons of concentrates per cow fed uh, per lactation. And on my right, we have the standard energy diet, where it works out about a ton, ton and a half concentrates fed per cow per lactation. Same forage is fed at both, but on the high energy, the, the ration consists of about 40% of the ration of these forages made from grass silage, maize silage, and whole crop cereals. Standard energy consists of 60% forage, 40% concentrates, and again, the same forage is going in there. And again, we have a range of outcomes coming from there in terms of yields. And those cows in there, the high genetic merit cows in there, at currently averaging over 12,500 litres, and again at a 4.3 butter fat, 345 protein. The control cows on the same ration are doing about 11,500 litres in terms of volume, but considerably less milk constituents, and they will sit at about 3.8 butter fat, percent butter fat, and around 3.3 uh, protein. So there is significant differences there. And on that particular system, we've got the, the ge high genetic merit one, the select ones, they'll be doing 9,400 litres, and the control animals, the average genetics on there, they're just doing about 8,900. And again, representative on the, on the milk components there too. Like so. Behind me, you can see in the distance that there is a uh, hoco feed bins or hoco farm feed, feed bins. These are for measuring intakes. So again, we have detailed feed intakes for these groups of cows on the representative rations and also water intake. So that again, and then as the cows are milked twice daily, we get milk yields, and then we get body weights, and we've got intake. So we've got a whole raft of information. This herd here is one of five within the world of the amount of data that's generated on a daily basis. So on top of all of that, then we have other uh, research projects ongoing. At our other site at Acrehead, we have a feed trial there for a commercial feed company, where we've got 20 cows on a four month trial and then there is actually four different rations fed to five cows through these uh, similar feed bins. So that's a feeding trial for a commercial company going on there. We have the well calf project running, which is looking at different ways of evaluating new, new pieces of equipment that will give you early indicators of any ill health in, in, in calves. For more information, visit fars.scot. Excellent calf management is a key to ensuring healthy, productive heifers are reared for the dairy herd. This starts before the calf is born and continues through weaning to bulling and calving down. I'm James Copeland. Um, I've worked for SRUC for 35 years. My role at the Cry and is a um, calf rearer, stock person, young stock rearer. At Crichton, the management of the newborn calf is designed to provide it with a strong immune system. 
When the calf's born, it's given four litres of colostrum, it's tested for quality, um, out the freezer, it's defrosted, it gets four litres stomach tubed. After that, the calf's brought across to the hutch and it's tagged and it's iodined. Not only does every calf routinely receive colostrum by stomach tube, additional steps are taken to ensure the quality of this colostrum by pasteurisation. We take the first milking off the cow, test the colostrum, if it's a good quality colostrum, we then um, bag it up and then we put it into the pasteuriser to pasteurise it. And then it's then put into the freezer once the pasteurise is over. We pasteurise the milk um, to try and stop yonis into the herd. So what about the targets for calves at Crichton? Calves are weighed at birth, so our targets um, to double their birth weight. Birth weight 42 kilos, so hopefully weaning 90 kilos. After six days, they get um, two mil of Respovalve intranasal. They come out the hut chase and they go into their glues and onto the automatic feeding system. Got to train them to start with. Within a day, they know what to do and they come into the automatic feeding and we've got automatic weighing, so they get weighed. In the automatic feeding system, as you can see, um, there's the milk. There's water, there's pellets, and also there's for straw, for roughage, um, so they can get whatever, they, and it's all measured and weighed out, so we know what the calves are eating and drinking. At Crichton, post-weaning management of young stock is of key importance to ensure targets are met to calve heifers at two years old. Pete Little is the dairy farm's manager at Crichton and oversees the process. I started as a dairy person, uh, progressed to the acre head milking unit which is across the main road, uh, became senior herds person down at acre head and in the last six months I've just taken on a new role as dairy herd manager uh, here at Crichton and Barney College. We aim to, to wean the calves at 56 days. We would be looking for target weaning weights, at least doubling their body weight. So as I said, a 45 kilo calf, we'll be looking for it to be at least 90 kilos by, by weaning. Once they're weaned, we then move them from the igloos, they go into a stock pen where they're fed uh, starter pellets for about a fortnight after they're weaned. We then transition them on to a heifer rearer pellet, which is a 20% protein pellet, and we'd be looking for growth rates about 0.75 kilos a day, uh, at least up until bullying age. We weigh them monthly, so they're weighed monthly. We also do a wither score. So by bullying age, we're looking for a heifer that will be 350 kilos and it'll be a minimum of 1.25 metres on the weather scale. And so we're looking to, to start serving at least at 13 months. So we need a heifer, as I say, we need a heifer to be 350 kilos by 13 months to, to maintain that two-year calving. Heifers are served using sexed semen. This not only ensures that heifers are giving birth to smaller calves, but also reduces the number of dairy bull calves born on the farm. We don't actually use any electronic heat detection devices here. Uh, all the cows in both, uh, all three units have all got electronic heat detection devices, but because the fertility is actually so good in this shed, it's not broken, so why fix it? Uh, so it's just visual fertility checks every morning. James will come down here first thing in the morning, it's his first job. He'll spend 15, 20 minutes in this shed just looking for bullers. He'll then come back into the shed again about a couple of hours later. He'll have another check. He'll scrape the shed out and sometimes during movement, you know, this is when you'll pick up one that you maybe missed earlier. of fertilisers at the Crichton have been significantly reduced. This has largely been down to the slurry management of the farm. A variety of crops are grown on farm for winter feeding, which is used for both the milking cows and young stock. Slurry is an important resource which aids the growth of the crops. 
our main crop will be grass. Grass grown for a limited amount of grazing, but more primarily for cutting. We have done for a number of years now practice a, a multi-cut system of grass uh, harvesting, so we'll start mowing grass early May, and that will continue at sort of four or five week intervals right through till September. Arable crops that we grow in Crichton uh, are winter wheat, winter barley, and, 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 and maize. There is a crop of beans this year, spring beans we put in. Rationale for that, it's a legume, so it doesn't need much in the way of anything uh, in the way of nitrogen aspects like, but it's still a crop that needs P and K, uh, but uh, it'll get fed the following year with that, but it'll, it'll, it'll provide soil-based nitrogen there like so, and also a homegrown, homegrown source of protein for other reasons for what we want to benefit from that. Soil sampling is a quick and easy way to understand what is happening in your fields. Soil analysis, soils on, on Crichton, we do farm within a nitrate vulnerable zone, the whole farm at Crichton is in, it sits within a, the lower Nestdale nitrate vulnerable zone and 90% of the land is classed as a sandy loam, so that brings restrictions on the land when you can apply organic manures and when you cannot and also obviously any chemical nitrogen if you're going to be applying that. So that puts a restriction on it, but we are a sandy loam, fairly free draining soil. So early grass growth works and, 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 and fits in with that, but equally so uh, growing uh, the, the range of other crops as described earlier, they, they all seem to fit in and up in there. Soil testing or soil analysis, whatever we want to put it, along that lines, uh, I embrace that, tend to do the, the whole farm every four stroke five years and get a full uh, analysis of the soils. And to be honest, the benefits of that there are, uh, I would say, to give me a pH for a, for a liming. Optimum is, and we all farm towards the optimum and not always achieve it, but the optimum would be around the six, uh, the, the, the score of six for a pH or 6.2. But uh, if you don't know what your pH level is, how are you ever going to fix it? If you don't know which, so you need a, a marker. Doing that operation of, of soil testing We've embraced the, the digital world there of actually marking the farm out so we now know in hectare blocks which area the farm is so we can strategically apply lime to correct pH. And also as part of that exercise of doing that soil testing, we'll also test for phosphates and potash. And again, if they're needing corrected, they will be corrected. They can be corrected quite easily through a, by, chemical by chemical application, but I tend to farm this farm as near as much as possible from using the organic, which we see behind us in these stores, which is obviously a nutrients there or slurry as it's well otherwise known. But by analysing that, I can then strategically apply my slurry to correct those P and K levels as much as possible. Different crops on the farm receive varying amounts of slurry. Growing grass for, for a multi-cut system on Crichton Royal obviously it takes a bit of degree of planning. So a good, uh, a good reasonable young grass sward would be is the, is the ideal optimum. But I would apply uh, organic manures from the towers behind me, uh, which is slurry. I've got it analysed. If I hadn't analysed it from a sample, I've got a, a, a normal sort of backdrop of a, a bank of, of data from that there. I would apply 30 cube to the hectare early March. And then again, mid-March, I would apply a straight nitrogen in the shape of urea a, with an inhibitor this year for the very first time. And that would be at 65 kilograms to the hectare of nitrogen. And that that sort of balances up to give me around about circa about the 100 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare I'm wanting in the shape of both from slurry and from, 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 uh, uh, from, the, from the bag as such. That will go on for first cut. Second cut, I then would reduce that chemical nitrogen, but the same slurry, it would be put on at 30 cube to the hectare after the, the first cut's over for the second cut and 50 kilograms of nitrogen. Going forward from there, into third cut, 50 kilograms of bag nitrogen, and again, 30 cube of slurry. And then for the fourth and fifth cuts, it would tend to be just a 30 cube of, of, of slurry per hectare going forward. So that gives me a five cut and the amount of slurry I'm applying. But bear in mind, we are obviously cutting and harvesting. So a lot of that is more so that potash is being taken off in that one nearly. So the other crops growing, uh, the cereal crops we grow in Crichton, the winter barley and, and the winter wheats, uh, are grown for whole crops 
whole crop cereal silage, but obviously the, op the option is there to combine for hard grain and for straw. I will apply a uh, to the growing crop of cereals, slurry again. There's always this sort of figure in my head, it needs to be 30 cubed to the hectare, and that is what I will be applying onto the growing crop of winter wheat. I, early, late March, early April, if the ground conditions and the weather conditions allow. It's not uh, practiced widely yet in, 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 in this area, but because I'm a heavily occupied uh, dairy farm with, with a lot of livestock units, we have a lot of slurry to utilise. So what we do there is we apply that now at the growing stage. It's a bit messy, it's not aesthetically nice, but come back a week later and that crop has responded to the, to the aspect of applying slurry. And then the other crop would be maize, plough slurry down, actually, so it's at the bottom of the furrow, and then apply slurry on top of the ploughing and leave that for a day, 24, 48 hours maximum. Work that slurry into that ploughed land, creating a very soil-rich, fertile seedbed for the seed, and that allows me to grow my maize all from the nutrients in these tanks. Lime is important in neutralising the pH of soil, and Crichton follows a protocol to ensure their soil pH is correct. Soil pH is, is hugely important, and get that right, then everything basically falls into place. That means that then you can make reference back to the Farm Advisory Services technical notes, which will then keep you right to achieve the optimum crop, whatever it be, be that five-cut crop, crop of grass, or be that a crop of winter cereals, be it wheat or barley, or that be a crop of forage maize. But back to what I said there earlier would be the getting the, that pH right, that allows all these nutrients in these tanks to be unlocked. And again, that is all way, widely available on the Farm Advisory Service technical notes. Improving slurry management has seen a reduction in fertiliser at Crichton, which not only reduces costs, but reduces the environmental impacts. For more information, visit faz.scot. So winter wheat crops at the moment, like other crops, it's suddenly turned wet and warm and they're growing rapidly. Um, so the crop we're in at the moment is just at flag leaf beginning to emerge. So that's a little bit early for the main T2 fungicides. And what you really want is the flag leaf fully emerged to be a good target for the fungicides. The difficulty this year is going to be that the crop's now in catch up mode. So the gap to the T3 to the ear spray is going to be quite short try and think instead about the optimal timing. So yeah, flag leaf fully emerged, but then those early stages of flowering in the crop, which where it coincides with wet weather, is really important for Fusarium and Microdopia infection. And if you delay that spray to try and get, if you like, good value out of the, the T2, you risk going beyond the point where it's really cost effective. So the visible disease in the crop at the moment is down there on leaf five, so still very much on the lower leaves and the dry weather earlier on in, in April has helped keep disease down. It's likely that it's now coming up through the crop, but you know it's not the highest pressure disease year that we've seen. So in terms of protecting the upper canopy, we're probably looking slightly towards the lower um, sort of dose range that you would be you would be thinking about. And again, very much about getting the timing right um, when thinking about those flag leaf sprays. Winter barley crops are just coming up to um, the booting stage and their T2 fungicides. There was quite a lot of disease in winter barley crops generally early on um, and the T1 fungicides at stem extension have generally managed that quite well. You can still see a little bit of rhynchosporium and net blotch in the crop we're in today. And what we're thinking about for that T2 spray is the ramularia risk on the upper leaves here. And the cold, dry conditions earlier probably haven't suited Ramularia that well. So we're not anticipating it being a particularly high uh, Ramularia risk in the winter barley crops for this year. So your T2 sprays, your final fungicides, should be aiming to manage that slightly reduced Ramularia risk and just keep an eye on any lower disease there. If it's well managed, you can probably come down dose rates. Um, but if it's still a problem, uh, just keep that in mind in your, your T2 fungicide programmes. The spring barley crop we're in at the moment is really fairly typical of many, so slow to come through in the very dry conditions. And now that we've had rain, that's helped a lot, but it's still slightly uneven. That very late emergence 
it means the crop is going to grow very rapidly from now on. So harvest will be at much the same time as always. So the crop will come rapidly through those growth stages. Disease-wise, there's very little there at the moment. So because the crop's growing so fast, you could think about whether the T1 fungicides at stem extension are really useful this year. If the crop is very clean and growing rapidly, you could just delay and treat at T2, so booting to ear emergence when ramularia is our main risk. But if you make that decision to uh, avoid the T1 fungicides on the basis of this late and fast season, um, then do walk the crops carefully and keep that in mind when you make your T2 fungicide decisions. All seed rape crops around the country flowering at the moment and the, the risk is sclerotinia but the risk of the sclerotinia disease is actually lower this year than in some years because cold dry conditions have prevented many spores. Wet conditions during flowering like this do increase the risk a bit so keep monitoring it but in terms of flowering fungicides uh, they're probably due to be applied at the moment and then it's just a question of the crop uh, ripening off ready for harvest. Light leaf spot levels have generally remained low around the country um, but nothing you would be doing about them at this stage either. Hello, I'm Raymond and welcome to the Rural Roundup. This week in farming, we see the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme deadline on the 30th of June. The scheme is for those of you who are interested in agri-environment options on triple SIs, slurry storage within priority catchment areas, public access or organic conversion. The SAC GS Grant Scheme claim deadline remains the 30th of September. Your claim form can be found at the end of your notice to proceed email or letter and it must be completed and accompanied by proof of purchase of your item, normally a bank statement and an invoice. Remember that due to Covid you do not need to have your invoice receipted. Funding is also available to help ensure that Scotland has super fast broadband by the end of 2021. To find out if you are eligible, enter your postcode into the following website www.scotlandsuperfast.com Vouchers are claimed directly from the supplier and are available for mobile Wi-Fi installation, satellite broadband or fibre optic cables. You can also pull your vouchers with your neighbours to supply broadband to your area. As the temperatures are starting to increase, so too is the risk of nematodirus infection in young lambs. Nematodirus normally infects lambs between 6 and 12 weeks of age. However, any lambs experiencing nutritional stress, particularly after a year like this, lambs sucking as triplets, lambs and hogs or gimmers or older ewes are particularly susceptible. Discuss with your vet eh, the risk factors and methods to treat it or visit the SCOPS website to look at the nematodirus forecast and an action plan. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more from FAS TV and the Farm Advisory Service. Thank you. Next time on FAS TV. We're in the northwest getting children interested in agriculture. We visit a farm diversification scheme in Caithness, and another farmer considers what advice they'd give to their younger self.